Okay, well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, we're ready to get started. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Dr. Charlie Schlein for being with us today. He's a longtime family friend. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about him. He is, uh, other than just being a dashing, handsome, fabulous guy, he's also a senior vice president and chair of pediatric services at Northwell Health, which is New York State's largest healthcare provider. He's the chair and professor and professor of pediatrics at Hofstra Medical School. Uh, Dr. Schlein did his undergraduate at, at his education at Queens College, received his medical degree from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and an MBA from Columbia University. He completed a pediatric residency at Texas Children's Hospital, an anesthesia residency at Johns Hopkins, and a fellowship in pediatric critical care medicine also at Johns Hopkins. And so we're really excited to have him here with us today um, and happy to see him. Hey, uh, you know, we, he has all these titles and he's a very, very accomplished person, but I just know him as Charlie. And when this uh, virus came around, um, we, we called Charlie to get his uh, understanding about what was going on. And I wanted to, uh, and I asked him then to be able to talk with all of us because he gave us so much information. So Charlie practices in New York. And you know, here we were in California seeing news coverage of New York hospitals overrun by COVID. Healthcare workers, equipment, facilities, and particularly ERs being overwhelmed. So Charlie, I would love it if you could just, um, Start us out with what happened in New York. Well, first off, hi, Melissa. And uh, thanks for inviting me, um, especially since it's the middle of the night here and on the East Coast. But, um, and when she says family friend, that's actually true. So I'm uh, really love being here with you. Anyway, um, yeah, this has been uh, one of the more interesting uh, episodes of my life. Um, and I've had, you know, in these six months since the beginning of March, uh, this has really been sort of multiple chapters of the same story. But we, um, we heard about things, you know, there were a couple of flare ups out here, you know, on the West Coast. Washington State. And so we were starting to become aware. And um, I'll first take you from a professional perspective, but we were meeting the last, uh, I would say from mid-February through the first week of March uh, as a team. And I'm part of, as Melissa said, Northwell Health System, which is uh, with 23 hospitals and uh, I happened to run the children's hospital as part of that and was part of the team planning for this upcoming, whatever it was going to be, because nobody really knew. We knew what had happened in China. We knew what was going on in Italy at the time um, and these sporadic cases on the West Coast. And we were planning for really a huge, a pandemic. And, you know, when you, we, we've talked a little bit before about, and, and, the, and the media talked a lot about, you know, running out of stuff, not being prepared. I, you know, I will tell you without tooting our horn all that much, um, we were really prepared. We had, um, just to give you an idea of what kind of planning went into this, we had at the time of about March the 9th, we had something like 10 million masks in inventory. And uh, we had ventilators in every room and we had, but nobody had any idea what was actually coming. And things just started growing exponentially, you know, seemed like day by day, but really week by week um, early on. And then you saw the stories erupt about what was going on and hospitals being overrun. And in fact, um, and ironically right near where, uh, 
Mr. Fox uh, and I grew up was really the epicenter of all of this um, in Queens, um, New York, you know, part of New York City. And it was really the city hospitals that really didn't have the ability to plan that were um, really overrun very quickly. We, we have a really good transport system. Um, we have a hospital in that area, Forest Hills Hospital. And what began to happen and all the major health systems in New York began to do was try to even out the number of patients from hospital to hospital. So it was, it was really quite something. I, I will tell you in terms of the children's hospital itself, we actually, and we all know, and we'll talk a lot about, because that's what I know mostly about is children, um, but because of the paucity of, of kids that were affected by COVID, um, we started converting our floors into adult COVID floors. And in fact, I'm building a new operating room suite in the children's hospital and what will eventually become our recovery room was sort of under demolition at the time. And we went in and uh, built a 61 bed adult COVID ICU in about 10 days. Wow. Pretty amazing. Unfortunately for me, we haven't been able to reopen yet because we're nervous about a resurgence and nobody wants to dismantle it. Uh, at least for another couple of months and we'll see what happens and we could talk later about what the possibilities are. So, you know, I, later on, and I'll, maybe we should go in order of how this sort of played out for me personally, but, um, uh, you know, I, I really was very involved with um, both the planning and then how we dismantled the children's hospital and how we redeployed, in fact, pediatricians and uh, our house staff, you know, residents, interns into the adult hospitals. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, what really impressed me about the story, about your story, is here you are, you have all these protocols, you have information from Italy and from China, so you know what's coming. And you're doing everything that you can do to get ready. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what, how this disease kind of, or the virus kind of overtook you? You know, because here you are, all prepared, and all of a sudden, you know, you were facing challenges that you really, I don't think, anticipated, personally. No, I don't think you can anticipate it. Um, so anyway, what happened was, and ironically, on Monday morning, March 9th, we hadn't even started socially distancing yet in anywhere in the country uh, on March, that weekend of March 7th, 8th. And in fact, I was, I was at a hockey game the week before in the garden. Um, we had played cards the week before. Um, so nobody was doing anything yet. And you may have heard of it out here, but in New York, in the Northeast, uh, I live in Westchester County in a little town called New Rochelle. And in fact, the day I got sick, and I'll tell you the story in a second, was the day that the the media went crazy and they called New Rochelle the hotspot. And in fact, the governor uh, called and drew a circle around New Rochelle. I didn't know about it because that morning, Monday morning, I went in and what I was saying, ironically, we were meeting and still as a large group. I mean, if I, you could picture this, we were still meeting. It almost seems quaint now with about 125 of us still doing the planning for a possible pandemic. And in fact, it was that Monday morning that leadership of the health system decided that we probably should not meet anymore as a group and that we would begin to do it virtually and um, you know, meet in small groups, et cetera. So that meeting went on in the morning. I went back to my office, which is about a half a mile away from there and then had some meetings in my office suite with a few people and everybody in my office suite. And then about two o'clock in the afternoon, I was complaining about 
the air conditioning being on or something, I was freezing and started having shaking chills. And uh, my trusty assistant sent me home. And I got home, I had about 102 fever, felt like crap. And um, I said, wow, I wonder if I have it. And uh, I, we didn't know anybody yet who had had it, you know? And uh, I, got, I called colleagues the next morning, got tested that day because I had been with like every leadership person <laughs> at Northwell Health the day before. And I got tested that day and believe it or not, got the results that afternoon and I was positive. So, you know, employee health went crazy. They interviewed everybody that had been at the meeting with me. They furloughed everyone at my table. My entire office suite was out for two weeks. And I... So um, here you are, yeah. at the meeting with all of the directors of your entire health system, the largest health system in New York State, and then you've all been exposed to COVID. Theoretically, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, yeah, no, contract I, tracing in, right, Charlie? <laughs> that's how it played out. You know? Anyway, the joke was, you know, I, 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 um, I slept that day. And then a couple the day after that, I actually uh, became afebrile. I felt good. I was calling people, telling them, you know what, this is nothing. You know, I feel like I have a mild flu. I'll probably be back at work faster than all the people that I furloughed. Um, and then on about day five, uh, the proverbial uh, crap hit the fan and I just started progressively feeling worse. Um, I never really had fever again. And um, I just started feeling nauseated. In retrospect, my appetite was like nil. Um, I told everybody around, I didn't want my kids, I have two boys and I'm living alone. Um, and uh, friends and my cousins live in town. Everybody was bringing me food every day. And then after a few days, I felt like my chest was burning. And again, in retrospect, I think my lungs were just getting more and more inflamed. And I had a pulse oximeter, which I had told all my friends to go out and get because we had heard from Italy that this was an oxygenation issue. So I've been monitoring myself a couple of times a day. I put it on, I go to sleep at night feeling good that, okay, my oxygen levels are fine. You know, this is, this is all good. And um, I really probably stopped eating and I was really nervous about getting dehydrated. And I kept telling him, yeah, I think I'm a little better today than yesterday. You know how the great rationale goes. And uh, ultimately about 10 days in, all of a sudden my oxygen levels dropped and I went to sleep and then they were worse in the morning. That was Saturday morning, the 21st. So this is like 12 days later. And I called some colleagues and I said, I'm really in trouble. My, level, my oxygen levels are really dropping a lot. And uh, got an ambulance, went over to one of our hospitals and landed in the emergency room. Um, that was an incredibly interesting experience. So, um, so now, now that that's so interesting to talk about. Like you have all of the information. I mean, you are a specialist in pediatric care, but you've been studying. I mean, you're the one who's been prep preparing the hospital for this right. oncoming virus, and so. Um, you know, day five, day six, you're like, yeah, I'm going to be okay. And then the precipitous decline. You know, we've heard that story. You know, that, that's pretty common, right? That, that people are like, oh, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. And then all of a sudden you realize that they don't have, you know, uh, lung function. Yeah, you know, what's been strange about this disease is that, um, especially at the beginning, when you started hearing stories, every story seemed a little different, you know, and... Uh, so anyway, I'm in the ER, I had oxygen on me. And at that point, all we knew is that, you know, now it's like two weeks into this pandemic. And it seemed like if you got into the hospital, you had about an 80% chance of like not getting out of the hospital. You know, and if you landed on a ventilator, I mean, it really looked very bad at the beginning. And uh, so I was like pretty scared. Um, and, um, so I'm in the ER 
and um, and any infectious disease guys who you know I happen to know because I work with them, you know, come in and we're talking about clinical trials. If I end up on a ventilator that afternoon, like which trial I'm going to want to sign up for, and I'm like making rounds, like I'm talking about another patient. So it was very surreal. Um, as I would sit back and think, wait a second, I'm the patient and I might be on a ventilator in a few hours and maybe not off. And, um, you know, I called the kids. I told them, you know, this, I don't know if I'm going to see you. Um, you know, it's, uh, that was the first time they knew I was actually in the hospital. Uh, and, you know, as you know, you know, uh, my wife had died like six months before. And I just like couldn't believe they were gonna lose another parent, frankly, uh, when, when they might. And, uh, you know, to jump ahead over a few hours, I started to stabilize and the levels actually started to come up. And so I got admitted to a COVID floor and spent uh, five days in the hospital and started actually feeling better. And being a patient, as you've heard, all heard, um, you know, in an isolation floor where you have no idea who's taking care of you. Everyone comes into the room wearing, you know, full garb and masks, et cetera. Um, it's unbelievable. I, uh, and I tell the story about, you know, I was like two days in to the hospitals. I got in Saturday, this is now Monday morning. And this nurse assistant, who's probably around my age, came in and he said, hey, doc, you know, we need to clean you up. We need to make you a person. And I was starting to feel a little better. And I said, oh, Sam, that, you know, it'd be like incredible. And this guy just took care of me. You know, it's like, and you never know where it's going to come from. I mean, it's just, that was pretty amazing. That was really, really amazing. And um, I've gotten to know him subsequently. I've gone over to where he works. And of course, he had no idea who I was either. But um, yeah, and you know, you still you can't see your kids, you can't see your friends or family, and I'm sure like they weren't allowing even people that you knew in the system to come see you because of the isolation. Rule, right. Right. No, couldn't get visited. Yeah. But I'll tell you, you know, we always talk about you know when the doctor becomes a patient or when the you know the nurse is a patient, and but I'll tell you after that experience. Um, when I got back to work, which was not that long after I started working virtually, at least starting to get on conference calls while I was still on oxygen and, you know, what have you. But um, I felt like I needed to like participate in this. Um, I think I was able to like help out in terms of how patients got treated. And, you know, we put we put like two way phones in each room with each patient so they could talk to not only their family and all, but they could talk more to like the nurses and, and other folks more readily without people having to put themselves in danger. So that was- Now, great. are you in like a reverse pressure room? Do they have special ways of containing the airflow? Yeah, they try, you know, we tried to put everybody in, a neg in what you call negative airflow rooms, but there aren't enough, you know, yeah. that was all overwhelmed. Uh, and in fact, I started to hear about while I was still in the hospital, I started to hear about like colleagues of mine who were sick, or their spouses who were sick, and I'm thinking they could be like next door to me and like, who would know, you know, so that was sort of weird. So and, were you one of the only providers who became ill in the system or was there a number of healthcare, healthcare providers also? There were some. I, I'm actually amazed. And I mean, there were some who got sick. Um, and, uh, you know, hard to know who gave it to who. I, I'll tell you what was amazing is actually the paucity of healthcare workers who have gotten sick, you know, and that the PPE actually worked. I mean, that's sort of our little joke or our little secret. And with every, you know, certain people putting it down and saying, you know, it's all crap. And uh, the fact of the matter is most of the docs didn't get sick, um, but everyone got redeployed into these COVID units. There were very few patients that came in otherwise, but the ERs were just packed, lined up, you know, with patients in respiratory failure, Melissa, as you said before, 
And it was just like, you know, the first, I mean, for weeks and weeks and weeks, you know, probably until really the end of April. So really from early March to end of April, it was just like another world, you know, so. We could only watch from, you know, online as it was happening. And, you know, they were predicting a lot of this stuff here and, um, you know, it really didn't come to pass, thank God, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that it didn't. You know, we certainly have had overloaded hospitals, you know, for, for, for short periods of time, but we haven't seen the same problems that you, you guys had in New York. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I spoke to you maybe two weeks after you got to the hospital, you know, and, and so, like that. Yeah. yeah, you were saying, and then we talked again later, um, have you had, well, you told me a story about your x-rays I'd like you to tell, but, can, but like, you know, people also think like, oh, thank God I survived COVID and now I'm going back to normal. Like everything's the same, but that's really not the experience. I was wondering if you could like tell us what your personal experience is, you know, um, having, having gotten well now. Yeah, sure. No. And I am in like great shape now. My trainer told me I'm in better shape now than I was in February. So that's, that's great. And, you know, you know me, so, you know. I think I think I'm doing okay, but um, yeah, I was on oxygen for about a, four or five weeks. In fact, I did my first faculty meeting, you know, via Zoom while I was still on oxygen, <laughs> nasal prongs, and I had there were probably three, you know usually our faculty meetings live drew about you know 80 people, which I always thought was great. I think we had like 275 faculty. Um, I guess they all wanted to see me on oxygen. I don't know, you know, but um, that was that was pretty funny. I um, I was still having new symptoms, like after I got home from the hospital. For example, um, I got home on the weekend, the following weekend. So I'm now almost a month in. I started having like chest pain. I convinced myself I was having you know, myocardial ischemia. I mean, there were already reports of, and now we know well that many patients did have coronary disease or, you know, pericardial, you know, fluid around the heart, or, you know, muscle, heart muscle not working so well. I convinced myself now I have like this new heart problem. So it was like awful. You just, you know, you're feeling better. And I actually, my appetite when I got home was spectacular. And, um, um, and I had, I went and went to see the cardiologist and got an echo and the EKG. It turned out my heart was okay. And I probably had some pleuritis, you know, inflammation still around the lung. But uh, you, you're referring to my uh, lung scans. I told Melissa that, um, and it was many, many, many weeks later, I went for a repeat CAT scan of the, lung, of the lungs and uh, the radiologist, who's a friend of mine, this guy, David, and he puts up the, the x-ray on a, on a screen and I'm looking at it and I'm already, now I'm like three months out and I still have patchy disease all over. And I said to him, I turn around and I go, really? He goes, um, let's put your original one up the day I got admitted. He puts it up and I'm looking at it and I had convinced myself I had embe been embellishing uh, this thing over a period of, uh, you know, months now. And I looked at him, I turned around and I said, I'll tell you, looking at that original scan, I'm happy I'm in your office here looking at that original <laughs> scan. It was scary. Um, and, uh, you know, this is what I did for a living. So I, I know scans, um, that, was, that was pretty crazy. But yeah, I lost about, uh, you know, in two and a half weeks, I lost like 20 pounds. And um, I gained back half bits. So anyway, my son moved in with me when I got out of the hospital, my younger one, Zach. And uh, he cooked for me for, and I, I soaked that for about three weeks. <laughs> until he goes, I think you're well enough to cook for me now. So uh, we took turns, but he, he really cared for me for a few weeks, which was spectacular. And uh yeah, that was it. But, you know, I went, I basically started working virtually. And then um, once I was off oxygen and feeling strong, I started to go in like half days every other day. And, um, you know, I'm working full time now, although I'm still working from home like two days a week, which is, I'm 
they never quit that. I don't, like a lot of them. <laughs> You know, Charlie, and it's it's so important to understand the whole spectrum of, of COVID uh, when we're talking about children, because children are parents, you know, and grandparents. And I, I couldn't imagine, you know, that for months at a time, you would have been able to care for, you know, a kid, right? You had trouble caring for your kids, had to come care for you. And so um, when we're talking about pediatrics, um, it's really the children's, you know, kids live in the world of adults, too. So, and today it was reported just today that 500,000 children in the U.S. have tested positive for COVID. Now, they're not really making a big play to test children, right? So who knows who's gone untested, right? But the American Academy of Pediatrics has reported that not only do children, um, not only do we have 10% of the cases being the children, right? But that in the last two weeks, so really since schools just started opening, till the increasing, the, the percentage of children who have COVID has increased by 60% in just the last two weeks. So uh, other than just being able to, you know, transmit the disease, which I'd love to talk with you about later, I would love to see, uh, or, you know, kind of, talk about transmissions and viral loads and all that stuff in a bit. But first of all, I wanna see, I wanna know like, how are you seeing COVID present in children? Yeah, so, you know, what's been fascinating is that, look, we know that the kids have only been, you know, are very, very infrequently affected, number one. But there is clearly, there was a, we had a cohort of patients, um, that had COVID that tested positive and who were sick. Um, we actually published a paper on like the first, you know, 50 children with COVID. Um, most of them survived, um, some with chronic issues. Uh, many like adults had chronic complex disease. We had a couple of kids with, um, you know, who were immunosuppressed that, uh, had problems, although most of our kids, uh, you know, even on chemotherapy and all, uh, actually did really well and were not affected, which was obviously wonderful. And um, so we did have kids and the ICU, you know, was filled at one point with just kids with, with COVID. And so, you know, that was, uh, that was one aspect of it. And we still, every once in a while, we've been admitting a kid. Uh, we have one in the house from the hospital right now um, with COVID. And but, then, of course, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Melissa, but. No, I was just going to ask you, um, go ahead. And then my, my follow-up, well, I'll ask you now, is what kind of safeguards are in place right now in your state? Yeah. So let me just finish. So medically, you know, then all of a sudden we're seeing a new disease, you know, a month later, six weeks later. And it was like, what's going on? You know, I, um, we've known about Kawasaki's disease for a lot of years. In fact, another irony in my life is that the first paper I ever wrote was on Kawasaki's disease with my former chairman of mine a lot of years ago. And, um, and we're seeing all these kids come in with what look like some spectrum of Kawasaki's. And it became pretty clear they were all testing either positive for COVID, very few. They all had antibodies though to COVID. Then the CDC came in, Department of Health came in, and we, we saw a few dozen of these kids and ultimately we gave it a name, you know, MISC, multi-inflammatory syndrome of children. And um, ultimately got defined by the CDC. Uh, again, we wrote a major paper on three dozen kids. Um, and in fact, we're now studying the blood of all these kids to try to figure out why they got, but this was a post-infectious disease that affected in severe cases, the heart. Um, kids with, Kawasaki's, which is, you know, a, a, maybe a post-infectious, we've never figured out the cause of it. And this isn't that exactly, but similar. Um, you know, it, it, they're, they're, the, the beauty of it is it's treatable. And so 
I then, we were out in the media a lot, basically telling parents, here are the symptoms, and you need to bring your kid to medical attention because this is a treatable disease, you know, with aspirin and steroids and immunoglobulin. And in fact, the kids, the 50 kids that we followed, in fact, we were talking about it this morning, um, mo almost all of them no longer have any heart disease at all. And their coronary arteries are normal. So that's also great news. But we were out there. Now, again, it's not, you know, we're talking about an epidemic, right, of you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people affected in the New York region of which, you know, we had in the home New York, in all of New York state, there were 200 cases. We saw about 25% of all the cases in the state, um, which was interesting. So, you know, the thing just sort of kept playing out in different ways. And I'll tell you, it's been, you know, it's probably only the second time in my life other than rare genetic diseases that you know, we saw a new disease, you know, the first one being AIDS, you know, and, and now this. Um, can you, can you explain very, what the symptoms are of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children? I mean, I've had a little bit of experience with inflammatory problems mm -hmm. and they don't sound that scary, but, um, you know, yeah. when, well, when you first see your kid's uh, skin crack and bleed, you know, it uh, kind of changed your mind about inflammation and how dangerous it is. So on the one hand, like what, what are you looking for in kids for these syndromes and, you know, initial symptoms? Because you're saying bring the kids in, but what, what are we looking for? Yeah, what we told parents and what we'll continue to is, first of all, a few days of fever um, that is really unremitting, even though it may not be very high, but typically these kids had, over three days of fever in a row. And some of them had coughs, but a lot of them had GI symptoms, diarrhea, vomiting, poor appetite, they were lethargic. They did have sometimes irritation in the mouth or rashes or swollen hands, swollen feet. Some of them looked like Coxsackie disease, you know, hand, foot, mouth disease, for those of you who are parents and have always been nervous about that. Um, the big problem was the coronary artery aneurysms. And, and so the kids who were already getting severe at home were acting like people, like adults with heart failure, you know, lethargic, couldn't eat, maybe getting swollen, um, you know, turning gray or, you know, poor color. And so that was, that's the big problem with uh, that disease. Now, when you're seeing COVID in children, um, I've read that it affects different ages differently and that there's different susceptibility of different ages. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, it's still, you know, there've been some conflicting studies. Um, I think where it's gonna land, the yet very young kids, let's say five and under, even though there was one study published uh, about two weeks ago, that's contradictory to what I'm about to say, seem to not harbor it very much and very few got sick. Um, we actually interestingly followed a bunch of newborns whose mom, the pregnant moms, actually tested positive and we obviously tracked all of those infants very, very closely and none of them got sick even though some of them actually tested positive. So the very young kids had virtually no disease, except for a couple that, as I said, had chronic illnesses that did get sick, but very, very rare. But I think once they're past the age of, you know, five, but clearly kids 10 and over, we know are spreading it. Um, we know they're testing positive. And what you described before, Melissa, in terms of all these new cases testing positive, most of them are, you know, kids, let's say seven and up um, and with a predominance of old, you know, adolescents. So, you know, that's the fear, even though, look, it's very clear that in children, adolescents, young adults, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, if they're affected, either are asymptomatic or only very mildly symptomatic, 
But the fear is, you know, you go home to your parents, you go home to, you know, grandparents and what have you, and we know that they're going to be a, uh, a focus of infection in that way. And that, look, that's one of the fears in terms of all the school reopening and all. You know? Right. Children don't teach themselves, right? Really so not. a lot of adults in that process. And there's administrators and there's bus drivers and there's school lunch providers and janitors. I mean, it's an environment run by adults and all of whom might be susceptible. But, you know, I love hearing that, uh, you know, PPE works, right? I mean, that's, that's great news. I mean, uh, and I think um, we have seen infection with, um, or, or viruses with, uh, Help frontline healthcare workers, but I think there's also been a shortage of PPE. So it'd yeah. be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, so one last question on, on the virus itself. Uh, what do we know or suspect about what the long-term effects may be of COVID-19, either in adults or children? Yeah, I think that's probably the most fascinating question of all in that you know, now that we're six months in, it's pretty clear there are a lot of people with who are going to have chronic illness. And that's why I don't, I don't really joke around about where I sit today. Um, I think I really dodged a bullet. You know, I'm 66 years old. So, I mean, I'm clearly, you know, in a higher risk uh, population. Um, and I have friends who got sick who clearly have chronic fibrosis of the lungs. So that would be the most common is patients on ventilators who either have COVID related chronic lung disease or ventilator related chronic lung disease from having been on a ventilator so long. But, you know, look, there are a lot of patients who have had neurologic issues. Um, in fact, there was an article today in the New York Times about uh, neurologic issues associated uh, with COVID, there are patients who have had strokes. We all know about the clotting issues in patients with COVID. So wherever you can clot, that's occurred. So we've seen it in the brain, we've seen it in coronary arteries and you know heart attacks. We've seen it in the kidneys. There's been a lot of chronic kidney disease. That's gonna be the one you're gonna read more about that there's been very little written about. But um, we know a lot of, we have a lot of patients who have chronic kidney disease now who might need dialysis, may need to go on to transplant, you know, it's hard to know. Um, so, and then, you know, when it, we haven't even talked about the psychological overlay and the PTSD and the, you know, the, 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 the effects on um, families and patients themselves who have had near death experiences. And um, so it's, um, there's gonna be a lot of chronic illness. Wow. Well, that's, that's it. That is very scary, you know? And so, but we, you know, people have been, you know, at least in California, we've been under an executive order, uh, banning gatherings and, um, mandating, uh, that we, you know, shutting down our schools, closing our businesses. And, you know, frankly, it is work. And I'll, I'll tell you in my city where we put a mask ordinance in place and enforce it. Yeah. We have a much, much lower infection rate than other cities. So, I mean, we, Wonderful. we've made a real difference and, and much lower mortality rates too. Yeah. And we only have one uh, reported skilled nursing facility uh, infection. So, so that's great. But, you know, things are about to change, right? We just moved out of the tier. We have a tier system and we were purple, which is like, don't even think about it, and we just moved to red. Which and so they're talking about just as we're coming into um, weather changes and a new season. We just opened up restaurants for some limited indoor uh, dining, and uh, September twenty second, uh, schools will some schools will be reopening, and um, you know we're all a little nervous. And we all want our children to get back to normal. We all want kids to have their educational opportunities. But, you know, frankly, what you've described is terrifying, you know, and is easily scarring on family members. So uh, not only do we need to prevent our children from getting sick, we need to prevent them from being little vectors as well. 
So um, we're set, what, what challenges, let's start with what challenges do you expect uh, that in-person learning environments are gonna present? Yeah, well, let, let me say this before we, before I even answer that question, that, you know, the yin and yang of this is that most kids do better in school. And most kids do better with socialization. Um, and, you know, it's been rough, as we know, on most parents, particularly with small kids at home. And so, you know, this tremendous pressure from all sides to open schools and to not open schools for all the obvious reasons. Um, we have spent a lot of time recently, so this has been like now the next phase of COVID for me, you know, going from illness to COVID in children to, to MISC and now, you know, school opening. And we've been, actually, we've done a couple of panels recently for the school boards and teachers and school nurses. And, you know, the states, all of the states, I think have put out pretty good regulations. They differ a little bit. So I, I hate being super specific, but, you know, first of all, kids wearing masks is going to be needed. I think the older kids who are moving around a little bit more, obviously it's easier for them to keep a mask on all day, which is a good thing. We've been telling parents to start practicing mask wearing with especially the little ones who, now a lot of them have already been doing it, which is good. And, um, but, and I see kids walking around, you know, with their masks on a lot, but there are some that don't. Um, you know, we've, we've asked the schools to make changes to make sure they have isolation areas for when a kid has a fever and they're waiting for parents to pick them up and assuming that they have COVID. Um, you know, teachers um, are obviously incredibly fearful um, and wear masks. We've, we've, the school nurses are getting supplies of N95 masks uh, in terms of being with kids who may actually be infected. Um, you know, trying to cut down all the group stuff, obviously extracurricular and, you know, sports and schools. And again, I don't want to be, you know, super specific, uh, you know, regionally, but I know in New York City, you know, I mean, that's not going to be allowed at all. Trying to, you know, and then keeping track of who's with who, and especially in the high schools where you know, there's more intermingling. That's where the problems are going to occur, probably where it's going to be harder to trace who's been with who. And uh, we're going to have to see. Um, so tracing, maybe. masking, right? Now, one of the problems we have in California that I know you don't have as much uh, in Queens and Long Island is class size, right? So we've got 40 kids in some of our classes. Right. And I don't know that they're all going to show up because we do have a hybrid option. And I know I, we have people who uh, have opted to do uh, completely online or some online. And um, so what about class size recommendations? And that's no, one question. No, absolutely. I mean, we're basically asking them to distance as much as you can. And I mean, most of our schools are going on pure hybrid or totally remote you know, with that choice, I'm not aware of any school systems around here, they're going to be full time at school. So that way they can thin the classroom size out, space the kids, clearly not having you know, two kids at a desk the way uh, we all grew up at, uh, you know, in PS 214. And um, it's, um, you know, making that attempt is really going to be uh, uh, crucial, you know, no, you know, if you're going out for gym, for example, not putting, you know, three classes together and playing ball, but trying to keep the kid, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty rough, right? Well, my friend's picture went viral for Gina Clayton Tarvon, and she showed her classroom. She has a descending plexiglass um, uh, blocker that she's going to stand behind. And then there's the kids have their, you know, plexiglass slots at their desks. And um, that, that's going to be really interesting. 
Well, we've had also, we've had our childcare open because of course we have to have childcare available for frontline workers. And what we've seen in those childcare facilities is that a percentage of them, like maybe as high as 20%, have to be shut down because of the exposure to coronavirus. And then they have to be completely deep cleaned and that whole process takes yeah. about a week. And that's one room. Yeah. So uh, have you, I, I know you're an expert on this. Have you been seeing any of this around the country with schools that have gone back? And one, have we seen outbreaks? And two, when you have a reported outbreak, what, are, what should you do? Yeah, well, the rules have most of the districts in New York City, as well as most of the, you know, Long Island um, towns, you know, if there's a case, that classroom um, if there's a second case, that classroom gets shut down. If there's a second case, um, they could close the school, uh, you know, again, for two weeks. And as you're saying, with deep cleaning and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, a lot of this is fate, is on good faith of parents um, not sending kids to school. Um, and, you know, think about that, you know, we're in a situation economically, which is, you know, nobody here is naive to that, um, which is really tough. Parents need to go back to work. Um, so the pressure from parents is, is very real. Um, you think about what's happened in, you know, areas of, you know, uh, uh, you know, minority areas, low socioeconomic uh, neighborhoods that have been just, you know, in, in the Northeast were ravaged by this disease. With the desperate to get the kids back to school. Hey, and, and you get, have, you're not a real parent until you sent your kid to school after throwing up going, suck it up, I gotta go, just get in the car, right? I mean, we've all done it. Maybe, yeah. I mean, you know, we've all been like, ah, it's just a sniffle, go, right? I mean, we know. Because it's so disruptive, there's no real provision for children to be homesick because we just haven't had that room. And here in California, teachers typically get ready for school by going out themselves to buy Lysol and Clorox wipes and their own Kleenex. We don't, I mean, they, have, they don't have them supplied because of the uh, school funding system. And that was before coronavirus. Right. And so how much more now are we going to have to be so um, aware about the need for cleanliness in the classroom? I mean, teachers, you know, have been doing this themselves. They, we can't put that burden on the on the teacher. Another issue it's is having, yeah. you yeah. talk about having a nurse. Our school and we're lucky if we get a nurse shared between a couple campuses. Right. I mean. So we do not have, and well, that's one of the things that um, I had heard was recommended by the American Academy of um, Physicians was that that schools that are going back should have a nurse on on site. Uh, do you think that's a, a recommendation? Well, you know, we've always recommended it. Again, I'm not going to get into the uh, the politics or the finances of individual school systems. Um, you know, in New York, that's more generally true than not. Uh, and, but again, you know, isolation techniques and, you know, there are schools that are very antiquated, as we all know, where there aren't really even good spaces to isolate a kid where they're talking about isolating them outside the school until the parents show up if they have a fever in class, you know? Yeah. Well, for us, most, most of our campuses are pretty open to the outdoors. So other than the, you know, the inclement weather, which is not that often in California, certainly compared to other places. Yeah. I don't think that that would be, I mean, having some kid go sit outside at the lunch bench is right. not a big deal, no. uh, you know, as it would be, you know, in New York City. But, yeah, for us, um, you know, for us, you know, winter is coming, right? Yeah. So, so um, I mean, what are you, so I, I think of myself as a parent, right? I'm trying to make the decision. I got to send my kid back to school because I got to work. I don't have another option, right? Yeah. Um, so what are we, what, what do you recommend we as parents can, can do and what should we be looking for, um, for signs of, uh, you know, alarm? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a good question. And frankly, the answer is actually somewhat simple. I think be smart, be vigilant, teach your kids 
how to stay safe. Hopefully you've been doing that for months anyway. And to say, listen, because you're back in school, all the stuff we've been practicing all summer goes doubly. So for school, you know, you, you need to like stay, you know, talk to the other kids, but stay a few feet away and, you know, clean yourself and wash your hands or, you know, supply them with their own wipes and, you know, hand cleaners, et cetera. And, um, you know, again, as I said before, wearing masks, we know now is critical. And, but, you know, taking a parental sort of developmentally appropriate um, approach with your own kids, you know what they can learn, you know what they can tolerate in one sitting. And, but I think prepping them for what's coming is the most critical side. And then, as I said, being vigilant as a parent about fever and about other, your other kids in the house being sick and then assuming everybody is and not sending the healthy kid to school. And because that's where we'll have problems. And I think if parents for the most part are smarter about it, uh, hopefully we can keep the schools open. You know, where children are not the best at hygiene on a good day, right? I mean, yeah. how many times do you have to tell them not to wipe their nose on their sleeve? And, you know, they're just not there. So are, would you recommend having them come home and take a shower after school every day? Or, you know, I mean, when I, in the beginning of the pandemic, I would go out to the store with having an immunocompromised family member. And I, I mean, it was, we didn't know where it was coming from. So we'd wrap everything in bleach and then I'd wash my hands. I'd leave my clothes in the garage, you know, because we didn't know. We didn't know how it was being transmitted. Sure. Um, so are there any special or regular routines you should, you can recommend? Hand wash, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash. You know, I think to concentrate on the other stuff, and this is sort of my view, I think takes away from what really works best. And I think just trying to, you know, wash or use a, you know, disinfectant, I think is really, really important. And look, you know, we keep saying, oh, the world is different. Everything's going to be different. Well, the fact is kids are um, having to take on chores and responsibilities that were unheard of before. And one of those is staying cleaner, right? And maybe in retrospect we, that you'll, you know, laugh at me and go, well, that was a joke. That couldn't have worked. Um, and maybe to some degree it will. Hard to know until, um, you know, we're through this thing. Yeah, and I've seen many children in my neighborhood, young, young children who were masked, and, uh, you know, Irvine is kind of this little oasis where my city in Orange County, where people are really focused on masking and uh, hand washing and, and social distancing. And as soon as we leave our little bubble of Irvine, I notice and go to like a neighboring city like Newport Beach, you notice like everybody's like in line and like, oh my God, COVID stopped at the boundaries. How did that happen? You know, um, but it's just human nature, you know, everybody, we miss people, we miss being together, but we also really enjoy living. So, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, I'm hoping that we can um, go forward with, with schools without any disasters, right? I mean, that's what we're all hoping for, hoping that we can get back to some normalcy. Can you talk a little bit about um, vaccines? Now, um, not like as an expert, you know, in the area of vaccines. But, you know, do we, wh what are your thoughts about this and uh, would it, in relation to children in particular? Because vaccinations are a big issue in the state of California, even though the, the established vaccines. Yes, it's a big deal. Um, we know California has led the way in craziness, but um, it's become a big deal everywhere in the country. And it's a big deal for our pediatricians too. I mean, it's a terrible ordeal. And in fact, you know, one of the, you know, we've, we've read a lot about all of the patients, the adults, particularly during the peak of this, that wouldn't go to the hospital, wouldn't go to the doctor's office because they were scared of getting COVID, you know, and died at home with a heart attack or a stroke or, and, you know, just did not go for medical attention. Um, 
Same is true for children. Even though children aren't getting sick for the most part from COVID, I looked at data today, our own data today. This is a one hospital set of data, so I'm not trying to make more. But um, the last eight weeks, our occurrence of new cancer diagnoses in children is up about 35% over the last, you know, for that period of time compared to the last few years. So you're talking about, I mean, I hate to use the term pent up demand for something like that, but that's what we're dealing with. Like both adults and kids have had, so a lot's been written, you know, and if you look at mortality rates in adults during, in New York, during the, let's say you take the 10 week or 12 week period of time, mortality at home was like multifold higher than it's ever been. Now, some of those pe people probably dying of COVID, but you know, many of them weren't. And normally they would have gone to an emergency room and just didn't want to. So to That's me, so the vaccine issue is very, very similar. You know, it's, um, there are a lot of kids not getting vaccinated, particularly if they're already past the age where it's, you know, regulated in terms of the beginning of school, right? And um, I, I'm very nervous. I mean, to me, the thought of having, for example, like a measles epidemic in this country because of COVID and all of the political craziness that's going on, and I don't mind being political when it comes to kids' vaccines, um, because that's something I feel incredibly fervent about. Me too, Charlie. I figured. But uh, I, um, I, that's what I'm very nervous about. I mean, we've had epidemics around the world of measles, of whooping cough, of, in, my, you know, in my professional lifetime. And it's going to get worse um, because we know the vaccine rates are dropping. Um, so, you know, I would like to see more money being put forward by both feds and state governments on, you know, like you got to vaccinate the kids during all of this. Now, the good news is I don't want to be, you know, totally, um, you know, a, a, a negative about it, but um, the numbers are starting to increase back in the offices, you know, and um, vaccine rates are starting to increase, but we still know that there's, there are pockets out there, um, including in New York, where um, the vaccine rates still overall are still down. And we know there's a lot of kids walking around that have not gotten vaccinated. So it's a big problem. Measles, mumps, rubella, whooping cough, all the stuff that we thought that we could get rid of, and now it's raising its ugly you know, head. All those diseases still exist, which is why we still give the vaccine. It's not like smallpox, you know? I mean, I still have cared for, believe it or not, in my life, in my, every single place I've ever worked, I've had a case of polio. You know, I know as bizarre as that sounds, like, you know, I'm not FDR, right? But um, uh, it's... Um, you know, these things are very real without vaccines, without yeah. vaccination. And that doesn't even go into the COVID vaccine and, you know, what's going to happen and the speed in which it's going to come out and the fear of people taking it right away. And um, So if we were going to check the efficacy and the scientific um, basis for research and the recommendations of a vaccine, where are you going to look to? to have that comfort level that this is a properly tested vaccine that's going to be safe? Well, I would hope that with the right news outlets and the, the, the people that you trust for the correct news and the correct science, that you'll be able to make a reasonable assessment of what is safer. You know, sitting here right now, we have no way to know, I have no way to know, like you should be using the Moderna product as opposed to, you know, the Pfizer product. I mean, there's no way to know that. Um, you know, in our lifetime and the, 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 the vaccine that we had the most problem with, at least factually, 
you know, was the flu vaccine, the swine flu vaccine from a number of years ago where there were cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome. The fact of the matter is um, something like one in 200,000, I, I, I don't know, remember the number, but it was something along the lines of one in 150 to 250,000, somewhere in there. So first of all, it's a pretty unusual complication. Second of all, most of those patients actually got better. Now, some didn't, you know, but there were also people that might've gotten the flu and ended up on a ventilator and dying too. So, you know, you gotta look at numbers and you gotta look at science um, as opposed to all the BS that we hear. Um, and I just ask everybody listening to this, and this is what I do all the time, this is why I've been doing a lot of media is I think this is the important stuff to talk about because and to just to like even out all the crap that we hear that's not scientific. And again, I'm not sitting here saying I know the answer to whether when a vaccine or multiple vaccines will come out that are absolutely safe. You know, first of all, nothing is absolutely safe. Nothing that we do, you know, taking a dose of penicillin, I could show you a patient who's had a seizure from a dose of penicillin, you know? Um, so nothing's free in life as our parents taught us or some of us did. Charlie, you've done a really great job about bringing us up to speed on this. And, you know, I remember spending so much time early on in the pandemic, just trying to understand what to do as a person and then as a mom and then as a city council member and then as a candidate for, uh, state office, and in particular on the issue of vaccines. And um, I really appreciate you adding to our knowledge base and telling us your personal story, because that's what, you know, it really helps us understand what this virus looks like. And I'm so grateful for you to be here today and giving us your time. Thank you so much. We're going to post this on YouTube. So, give me so, a, that, so yeah. let me read this for a final word. So first of all, follow me on Twitter where I only do science. And, um, and then I always have links to the stuff that we're doing, panels, school openings. So it's at Charles Schlein. So maybe, Melissa, maybe you could post that also. Yeah. That would be great. I was just going to connect. Yeah, and then the article you alluded to early on, I mean, I, I sort of went public uh, in early April with my ordeal. And um, so it was, you know, it's in the New York Times on the op-ed page. So if you just... Google my name in the New York Times, you'll find it. Um, and that's, um, you know, my pleasure. And, uh, and then there are always links to interesting stuff and whatever. So thank you. Well, I really appreciate it because it's so hard to find people who have things like degrees and experiences and residency and practical um, hands-on experience who are opining on the condition. There's a lot of people who will say, hey, I heard it from my friend who said, like, uh, you know, take, I won't, I won't make references, ah, but you know what I mean, crazy. less than scientific uh, advice. So, right. uh, hey, and, or, or I went to the beach last week and I had no problem, you know, so Thank you very much for being here, Charlie. And we're gonna to have to schedule another call to find out um, all the family dope that you let drop before we started. <laughs> My pleasure, I'm home. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.